Welcome everyone. Today we are going to be diving back into the 3D analysis of Miss Cool's custom steel bike that we first looked at a few days ago. Now, if you are just tuning in for the first time, I would highly recommend you go back and watch that first video before you commit to watching this. Because today we are going to do a very long format version of that video. We're gonna dive into the details. We're gonna look at the modeling assumptions, which I think are very important. And we are going to take a look at a dynamic analysis of this model. So I would like to say I am sorry for the previous video in that I realized after I had posted it that the graphics were downgraded of, of the model. The, the screen capture program I was using downgraded the quality of the screen capture to the point where it was very difficult to make out the uh, fonts and lettering and that sort of thing. So I do apologize and I hopefully have corrected that for this video. I'm using a Windows-based computer for my engineering software here and I use a MacBook Pro with a Mac operating system to do the video editing. And since most engineering programs are not uh, capable of run, being run on, on a Mac operating system, I have a separate computer that I use, which means that I'm not really ready to set this up and do a live stream yet. Unfortunately, this computer I'm using doesn't have as good of uh, our high speed. The internet connection on this particular computer seems to be a little bit slower. The software's older, and so instead of updating it, I'm leaving this computer for analysis software and I'm using the Mac for editing software. So I'm keeping them separate. So anyway, but I have looked at this program and it's called OBS Studios or OBS Studio. It's this here and it has some settings in it. And the video setting is, well, you can't see it because we're currently recording, but you can set the quality. And right now I, I had it recording at 1080p, but it was downgrading it to something much, much lower. So I've, I've adjusted that and hopefully now things will be, be better. Okay, I do have a couple more caveats and disclaimers to make. I wanna make sure that this video is not interpreted as a design guide for anyone out there who's watching. If you are in the market for a custom made bike, I would highly recommend you follow the advice of your frame builder. Do not take this analysis as information that you could use to apply to your custom bike. Uh, we here at the Henry Wildberry Studios are um, willing to experiment a little bit with things because we are prepared to pay the price if we screw up. What I, won't, what I don't want to see is somebody take this information and go out and have a bike made and then be unhappy with it and, and come back and say that this advice was bad. So please don't use this as design advice. Follow the advice of your experienced frame builder. And uh, on a side topic that's related to that, I would say that there is nothing, re there, it, nothing is, uh, can replace experience. No matter how much analysis we do, or any other person can do, it comes down to putting that to practice and to actually see if how it works out. So experienced frame builders have years and years and years of experience experimenting and adjusting and tweaking and working with lots of different people. And so the advice they have is very much uh, better than this. What I'm trying to do with this video is explain how some features of a frame will affect the flexibility of the frame and possibly how it could. These, these are sort of like ex explanations for why we see certain things happening. I don't see a lot of information as far as engineering analysis on bicycles. It's hard to find. It's At best, it's patchwork together. You could look around and see some things and you know read articles, but there really isn't that many uh, research projects and studies that have been done on bicycles and probably due to the fact that most engineers 
and scientists don't spend a lot of time thinking about bicycles. They're working on bigger, bigger scale projects and things. So the resources are limited as far as that type of research on bicycles. So it's really coming to comes down to experience these days. So I am putting this out there because I know a lot of people who watch my channel enjoy this type of thing as much as I do. And uh, it's just kind of interesting. It's just kind of fun to know what could possibly be the the uh, what what could be possibly causing some phenomena we notice. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about the model, the assumptions, and how it works. Then we're going to run a dynamic analysis because what I want to see is what is this frame's vibration characteristics. Uh, I don't think I've seen anybody do this before, so I thought it was fascinating that I could do it with this program. Now this is RISA 3D. This is a structural analysis program. It's available to the public, so if you want to download this and run it yourself, you can. It's a very high level analysis tool, but uh, with anything that's high level, you have to know how to build mo these models and how to make good assumptions. Um, anything that you know you can build a model and have bad assumptions and have a bad output so you have to really be careful using things like this uh, this you this particular model has mixed units in it we're running loads in in pounds and kips if you will and we're solving it for def displacements in uh, millimeters we also have lengths of tubes in centimeters and diameters in inches. The good news is this program understands the units and converts them for you. So there shouldn't be any unit conversion issues, but uh, that, that nevertheless is always something to keep in mind. So when you do see your output, you know, it should make sense. If it doesn't make sense, then there's, there could be something wrong with the unit conversion. But uh, I think I've run this enough now to feel pretty good about the results, but feel free to chime in down below if you think that there's something off here and you know it's very like there's there's a possibility that it is so feel free to let me know in the comments the last thing I really want to do is put out misinformation to anyone I, I really just doing this to help us uh, all better understand what goes into frame bicycle frame design or to some degree anyway uh, it's a complicated subject. A bicycle frame is actually a very complex structure. It seems pretty simple if you look at it, but it's complicated in the sense that when you try to do a model like this, this is a static model, and a bicycle is a dynamic structure. It is actually moving. It, it's held up in space by gyroscopic forces from the wheels turning, as well as the rider's balance. Uh, so it's a very unique vehicle in that sense. So it was difficult to model it and it's very, there's a lot of mind bending that goes into how to create sta a static structure out of a bicycle. But I did my best and I'm going to explain what I did and why I did it uh, so that you can see and make your own assessment of whether this is a good or, or not model. So let's start with the, the, first let's start with the boundary conditions. So on this isometric view, and I'm switching back and forth to elevation and isometric so that there's not some sort of optical illusion here. But down here, this is the rear chain stays and these are the boundary elements. These are the reaction points where the bike is essentially, there's reaction here, here, and at the front fork. There's also reactions in some way up here at node three, uh, but we'll talk about that later. Right now I don't have one modeled right here, but I have used, I do put a reaction here for certain load cases. There's also some, well, we'll talk about this. Let's start at the back. So the very basic reaction or boundary condition is node one and node seven. So these would be like the dropouts of the rear wheel. And there's one on each side because this helps provide some stability of the model. If I just had one in the middle of the rear uh, axle here and one in the center of the front axle, then this model would not be stable. 
it would fall over. And I would have to then put some sort of a reaction up here with a spring on it. And that's a possible way of analyzing it. But I chose to do it this way because this helps me to, for me to force the frame to deflect with certain load cases. So down here I have a pin connection which is restraint, which is a restraint in the X, Y, and Z axis and all three rotational uh, moments on the support are released. So there, it's a pin connection as it's called. Node 7 is also a pin connection, but it's only fixed in one direction, and that's the Y direction. So go ahead and look up here if you ever want to know what axis we're talking about. Top left corner, this is the coordinate axis system. You can refer to that whenever I mention X, Y, or Z. So it has a reaction in the Y axis, and that is to allow the frame, given some of these lateral loads we put on it, it allows node 7 to move in the x direction as well as in the z direction. And that is so that the frame can flex, and that is also so that the wheel can flex out of plane with the bike frame, which is often the case with a flexible bike. In fact, it's so often cited as a source of rolling resistance that I wanted to make sure I captured that in this model. And you will see it later how this deflection works and the frame does bend and it's allowed to move. Up here on the front, I went ahead, because I had the two supports here, I went ahead and used a single support on the front axle. Now the model is stable with this, even though there's just a single point load reaction, or I shouldn't call it a point load, it's a single point reaction, it's a pin connection, or pin, con, you know, pin support, at the center of this axle. Now this reaction is only in the x-axis and the z-axis. So it cannot move in the z and, cannot, and it cannot move in the y, excuse me. It cannot move in the y-axis or the z. It's allowed to move freely in the x-axis. And the reason I did that is so that when you load the frame up with a vertical load, such as that, the fork is a cantilever column and it is allowed to move forward, which provides bending. That is very common for a fork to do that. So I wanted to capture that deflection to show how much flex there is in the fork and how that contributes to the vertical spring of the overall bike frame. Now in the Z direction, it's restrained from sliding and that could be modeled as some sort of a friction uh, support of some sort where you create a, a friction support but that just gets really complicated so we'll just call it infinitely rigid in the Z direction as well so the tire cannot slide out of plane essentially. Now I model it also as a center point because if, with certain loads you have to allow the fork to rotate and that's because it would be allowed to as you were riding it. And so I wanted to capture that displacement as well. Now let's move up here to this uh, fork crown. As you can see, both fork blades come into a central point. We're not modeling the fork crown. And also, which I haven't yet noticed anyone point out or ask about, I did all, what I also didn't model is the steering tube. The head tube is modeled, the steering tube is not. There's no release around the axis of the steering tube, so this fork cannot turn. And I noticed uh, nobody mentioned any, no one asked about that. So uh, I, I wanna go ahead and mention it now because this is important. A bicycle is actually free to rotate around or inside this head tube, the fork anyway. And that will change the flex characteristic of the frame a little bit because you have a pin here. Now since this is a static model and I don't have handlebars or a stem and I don't have a human holding onto the handlebars to restrain that rotation, I just modeled it as a fixed connection. What might be a better way to model this would be to use a rotational spring at node 5. And perhaps a rotational spring with a rotational damper, but uh, that gets a little more advanced in terms of modeling and I'm not sure for the purposes of what we made this model for would provide us with any 
would provide us with much additional information. So I just assumed it was a fixed connection in terms of rotation around the head tube. Um, and that leads me into the next point. Every tube, the joints, these nodes are called, or where the joints are connected, these are all modeled as rigid connections. So there is no rotation allowed. And I'll, I'll show you what that means here. Let's solve this model for load. Oops, we're not, not yet doing that. Let's do a gravity load analysis. Okay, so as far as how the joints work, if you look at this, uh, you can see, we can turn on the moment diagram, and you will see that there are moments on the, wow, what's going on? Huh. Uh, that's odd. Why is that? Oh, is this axial? Oh, that's moment. Oh, basic load, sorry. We need to solve for basic load combination. I was wondering why we're not seeing any moments. We were solving for the wrong combination. Okay, here we go. So, as you can see, if I look at the moment diagram about the z-axis, we have moments at the joints. And you can see that everywhere, I hope. You can see that. You can see that there's a value for these moments. And actually, if you're curious, uh, we could actually look at those values with this load. But let's say it's moment, that's shear, moment about the Z. We can go to node. It's a very small amount. Load combination one. And what are the, yeah, so in units of kip feet, which is thousand pound, thousand foot pounds, you can see there's some values here in the Z axis. And that shows that all the joints have rigid, they're connected together with no rotations allowed. So they're, so that's why a bicycle frame generally is not called a truss. I know it's referred to that sometimes because it has the shape of a truss element where you have triangles that sort of hold it together. But the reality of a bike is it's a, it's a frame. It's a space frame. It has a three dimension to it. It's welded together. There are moments inside each of these elements. A true truss would be, would have axial loads only. There would be no bending moments allowed in the elements. And that's because at each connection, at each joint, there would be they would be bolted together as a pin and not a fixed connection. So that's why a bicycle frame, although it's called a truss, it's not a truss. Um, okay, so that you can see is the moment diagram. Let's turn that off. That's the deflection diagram. We can amplify that a little better. And I think I made a bit of a I know I said last time on the video that I think I was confusing about what is, is this model scaled or not. So let me explain what I meant by that vid in that video. So the model itself, the way it's drawn, the tube lengths, everything is to scale. And here you can see the units of the tube lengths. This is 50. This is a 55 centimeter top tube a 60.45 down tube and so on. The frame itself, all the geometry, the angles of the tubes, the offset of the fork, the lengths of the tubes and so on, the bottom bracket drop relative to these two boundary elements, boundary conditions, this is all model to scale. What I meant that was not to scale is this graphic of the deflection diagram. As you can see, I can scale the graphic up and down. I can make it, you know, I can make it look less drastic, but then you can't really see what's happening. And so if you amplify the graphic, you can really see what's happening. So it's for visual effect only, and that's what I meant, that the deflection diagrams are for visual effect only. 
as well as these three-dimensional ice or these you know these isometric renderings of the tubes these are scaled they're modeled to the correct scale as far as the diameter and the thickness and all that but what's not to scale is the graphic on the screen it's drawing these in a way that gives you a relative impression of what they look like okay and also i should say all the tubes are modeled as round cross sections or cylinder cross sections there are no ovalized cross sections like we do actually have on the fork and the ch and the uh, chain stays the seat stays i believe are tapered slightly we're not modeling those subtle changes or subtle differences in the real bike frame that makes the tubing and makes it really complicated to model the moment you go from a you know the moment you have a non symmetric cross section and you start tapering the elements you've it is very complicated to do that so in order to keep this simple and quick i model everything with just round tubes with the approximate diameter and thickness and i also want to say I did not model the actual budding profiles. That's something I think some of you also were asking. Did we model the budding itself? So what is budding? Budding is where the tube has different wall thicknesses depending on where it is along the length of the tube. So a manufacturer manufactures a tube. of a, They cut it a certain length, and within that length, the ends are thicker than the middle part. The middle is very thin. And the middle is thin because the stresses in the middle, the shear stresses, are very low. The shear and bending stresses are very high uh, here at the joints. And the joints generally need to be welded together. And so the tubing manufacturers leave the thickness of the tubes on the ends thicker so that when you assemble the bike, the joints are much stronger. And then in the middle where you don't need the strength for the connection, and you're relying simply on bending and uh, maybe some shear deflection, the tubes can be reduced in wall thickness here. That being the case, thinner tubes generally are more prone to denting. So you have to be careful how thin you go. They, there's a limit on how thin you can make this tube before it becomes so thin that it will dent if you accidentally drop it or something. So there's a balancing act as far as how thin you can make it and how dent prone it will be. The other issue you have to look at if you're designing a bike frame, a bike frame designer will look at this, they will decide how thin the tubes can be for the given load of the rider. Miss Cools is a very lightweight person. She weighs less than 120 pounds, so for her, running a very thin tube bike is, is fine. In fact, it feels really stiff for her. Whereas if I ride the bike or somebody heavier than me rides it, they think this bike is very flexible. So those are some things that the bike frame designer will work on for you and help you pick the, the correct tube thicknesses. This basically covers the model itself. And, you know, we did run some loads on it the last time and we looked at the some different cases. I'm going to run basic load case uh, two for a second because I wanna see the displacement diagram and I wanna talk a little bit about some of these load cases. So load case two, and you put on ISO. So in this case, what I've done is, these are just static loads that I arbitrarily selected. I just came up with these numbers, okay? They're not derived from any kind of mathematical model of a bike rider. I just took a 25 pound load and pushed on the head tube and the down tube. And then I looked at the displacement and I could see how the bike would behave. And then I could look at the deflections and I could compare this bike with this tube set. And then I could write all these numbers down and then I could change the tube diameters and run it again. And then I can compare the difference in deflection. And then I could come up with a percent difference in stiffness. That's how I did it. And I ran through different low cases. I prepared a spreadsheet, which I showed in the last video. I'm not gonna bother you with it again, but it was basically what we did. So what I wanna do now for this bike is, oh, and before I move on, notice the 
rotation here at the joint. There's a couple things you should note about this that's interesting, I think. One is, look how the axle's rotating. Just like I said, I wanted to allow that axle to rotate. And also, look back here. Node 7 moves. So you can see that the wheel is now, this axle is now on an angle to it. It's no longer perpendicular to the axis of the bike. It's, it's out of, it's skewed, I guess you could say. And that is what people will call a, a contributor to rolling resistance. And you can see that effect happening with this load combination. You can also see it with this other one that we did where we used the torque. This where we torque the bottom bracket. And if I solve for that load case, you'll see how it also deflects. So riding your bike out of the saddle, you know, you're cranking on it. You're causing the wheel to move out of plane with the bike frame. Anyway, I just thought that was neat. The model can show you that that happens. Now, I didn't talk about the node up here, node three, and I did a, I do use a, a boundary element here at, at times to replicate a big mass sitting up here. A big mass has a lot of inertia, and that big mass is the person riding the bike. They have a lot of inertia relative to the weight of the bike. And so when a rider is sitting on the saddle, there is somewhat of a reaction out of plane or in the Z direction for that condition. So if you're seated and you're climbing, that's different than standing and climbing with respect to node three. So what you might want to do when you run these different low cases is decide when and when not to put a reaction here or a restraint. Now, the best way to model that restraint might be to use some sort of spring and damper in order to capture the, the fact that it's not a hard boundary. It does give a little, the rider is you know a big mass, it's a human, it has some give and some flexibility and some damping. And so you can start to build into this model some of those complexities if you wanted to. Uh, but I didn't do that simply for the sake of time and just trying to make a decision on, on whether to use an oversized top tube or not. I mean, that is in fact the whole purpose of why I made this. Uh, model. So anyway, I just thought I would explain that, that I do once in a while put a reaction up here at node three. All right, let's go to the dynamic analysis. I really feel like that's going to be the exciting part of this video. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a dynamic analysis. We're going to choose our modes, our number of modes. Now this is a multi degree of freedom system. So there are multiple mode shapes that will come out of this analysis. And up here in the Eigen solution, we can choose the number of modes that we want to see. Now, so how many modes are there? Well, with this model, there's probably hundreds because of how complicated it is. But the higher the mode, the less of an effect it actually has on the bike and the way it feels. The, the most um, prominent modes are the first mode of vibration. That is the most uh, the lower modes, the, the first mode, is the fundamental mode, and that's the one that uh, contributes to the most of how it will feel or vibrate or bend and flex as it's oscillating. So you don't really need to model thousands of modes, you just need to get the first few. So we're going to do five. We're going to use the, for the load combination for our mass, we need to use load combination one because that is just the general weight of the rider on the bike. Miss Cools in this case. And we're going to look at all three axes here. I've already checked all these. And uh, don't worry about these. These ASC things are for American Society of Civil Engineers. They have uh, code requirements on how much mass must be participating in the dynamic analysis in order to make it valid. So that doesn't apply uh, to this. So we don't have to worry about that. But you can choose different. There's different codes and different uh, response spectra that you can use, but it just doesn't matter. So let's start the solution because we're not going to really look at the response spectrum analysis anyways. But what we're really doing is looking at this for a bicycle. Well, here are the different mode shapes and frequencies. So for mode shape number one, that's this line, the frequency of vibration for mode one is 4.07 hertz. 
and the period, which is one over the frequency, is 0.246 seconds. So that's the mode one, that's the predominant mode. And as far as the way this mode works is that if you look at the different axis systems, there's these numbers here, and these numbers represent percent. 71% of the mass for mode one is in the Z direction, okay? So that's telling us that the Z direction is the predominant direction in which this first mode is applied. And then remember, the Z is running perpendicular or out of plane with the spike frame. These other modes start to pick up some mass in the other directions. So like mode four, for example, it's looking at almost 65% uh, of the mass in the X direction. So that's forward and backwards. So that's a higher mode at a higher frequency. And so again, the more, the further up the mode shape uh, list we get, the higher the frequencies become and the less they participate in the feel of the bike. For us riding it, we probably won't feel the effects of the fifth mode of vibration, for example. And that is mostly, well actually we would feel that one more than we would feel mode four because actually if you look at it, the mass is in the Y axis. But, uh, but in general, the further you go away from the fundamental mode, the less you will notice that particular mode shape. So now what we can do is we can look at this mode shape, we can look at the deflection diagram of this mode shape. I'm gonna scale it down because it'll be way too pronounced and it'll look way too weird if I don't. So here's the mode shape. You've already seen something similar to this already. A couple things to note that the seat post is really pretty straight here compared to us where it was curving. I think that's interesting, but uh, let's animate this shape. So here it is vibrating in its first mode of vibration. This bike frame is oscillating back and forth in the first mode of vibration. Now this to me looks a lot like speed wobble or shimmy. And it's interesting that speed wobble and shimmy is a problem with bicycles, it's a problem with motorcycles. And in fact, a comment, somebody left a comment and I'm sorry I don't have the list up, but somebody sent me this really interesting link to an article that was produced by Leonard Zinn and then later, a math professor sent Leonard Zinn a response to his original article clarifying the difference between resonance and speed wobble and that they are not the same. They do share some commonalities, but they are not the same. A speed wobble is not a resonance phenomena. It is a bifurcation phenomena. And I just learned this because I read the article and it was a really fascinating read. I'll actually put a link to it in the description somewhere down below. But uh, essentially the, the math professor weighed in and said that uh, the bifurcation type, it's called a Hopf bifurcation, it is what explains the onset of oscillations in all sorts of natural systems from population dynamics to chemical reactions to airplane wing flutter to stability of steerers in bicycles, trucks, on trains leading to derailment to landing gear wobble on airplanes so for when it comes to shimmy and and when it comes to speed wobble the the phenomena is called hop bifurcation and the difference between bifurcation and resonance is that with resonance you have a forcing function that results in the frame flexing a lot or the structure vibrating. That forcing function has to have a sort of oscillation to it as well. And then when that oscillation of the forcing function matches the natural period of the structure, you get what's called resonance, where you get this unbounded vibration and can lead to structural failures and collapses. It can break parts. It's, it's a problem in a lot of different industries, machines, that use electric motors sometimes have resonance problems where the electric motor or even a gas motor, I guess, spins up to a certain RPM and the support system that holds the motor starts to oscillate 
and it oscillates at the natural period and suddenly the uh, motor that's spinning happens to be spinning at exactly at the same resonance that so on and so on you get resonance and then you get vibration that is very annoying um, we'll talk about that some more but I thought that was a great article I want to thank the person who sent me the link and sorry I don't have your name but perhaps you'd rather remain anonymous anyway so I'll put a link to it it's pretty cool there's some good videos in there about wings fluttering and some examples of the hop bifurcation so going back we can look at the frequencies of this mode shape again this is 4 Hertz and the reason this mode shape was fascinating to me and why I was leading into this video on the previous one was because as a bicycle when we are riding it we are pedaling with a certain cadence a certain rotational frequency and that's a forcing function if you consider that the pedaling itself is oscillatory it's you're pedaling you're pushing on one side and then you're pushing on the other side and you're doing that back and forth at a consistent tempo at a consistent frequency with a period of vibration so what is the period of vibration of then of a bicycle pedaling well first you have to decide it, when you are pedaling on one side you start your pedal stroke at the top and you push down through the bottom of the pedal stroke and as you do that the the other side of the pedal stroke reaches the top of the pedal stroke and you begin to push down on the top from the other side and then as that one goes to the bottom of the pedal stroke the other side comes back up to the top and now it's ready to push down again and you repeat this cycle over and over well that cycle occurs at your cadence so most people ride a bike cadence somewhere between 60 and 100 rpm and if we just go with 90 rpm for ease of numbers that is 90 uh, revolutions per minute which turns out to be one and a half revolutions per second which comes out to 0.667 revolutions um, which is 0.667 uh, revolutions or seconds per revolution excuse me the period is 1 over the frequency so 1 over 0.667 is a frequency of 1.5 roughly a 1.5 now that is for your person riding at 90 rpm if our bike frame has a frequency of vibration of 4 hertz then you don't exactly have resonance occurring um, but what's interesting is if you look at the solution to the equations of motion for for a single degree of freedom system you will see that the equation reaches some sort of uh, vertical you know it's unbounded to infinity right at that four hertz mark and as you get closer and closer to that frequency the amplitude of the displacements increases exponentially so when someone's riding at let's say 60 rpm their hurt their frequency is much lower so what they're going to experience they're not going to experience as much feedback from the bike than if they were to up their frequency a little bit and increase their cadence they're going to feel a little more feedback from the bike also if you stiffen the frame if you make the bike stiffer you actually increase the frequency which means it takes you even you'd have to pedal even faster to feel any kind of frame that's sort of feeling like it's going to be in sync with your pedaling input so decreasing the stiffness means you are going to decrease the frequency of vibration and as you decrease the vibration you're getting that frame closer and closer to your pedal stroke however it doesn't appear at least from this particular model that there would be a chance that you would ever reach resonance because you can't pedal at 4 hertz because you can't pedal at 240 rpm most people can pedal somewhere around 95 to 100 when they're really pushing it 
I've been able to ride at 105 up to 110 uh, by really practicing my cadence, but I would never be able to reach 240, and definitely not for any length of time. Over here, if you think about it, if you have a wheel and a seat post and handlebars, all those extra structural elements increase the flexibility of the frame. So it would potentially uh, decrease the frequency of the vibrations, but it would have to decrease it by a factor of almost two to two and a half. And that doesn't seem likely to me, but it would get closer to your uh, period, your pedal stroke cadence. It would get closer, but it's never gonna reach it exactly. You'll never get a one and a half hertz bike frame, bicycle uh, design. Okay, so let's look at some of these other mode shapes just since we have them. Let's look at mode shape four. Uh, let's apply that and let's run an animation of this. So this is mode four. Wow, look at that. That's pretty fascinating. And uh, let's look at mode, let's take a look at mode shape five. Here's mode shape five. The bike is, I mean, this is, this is of course exaggerated. But here's what happens in mode five. And this occurs at, what's the frequency here? Mode five is occurring at 95 hertz. So not something you're ever gonna probably experience, but at, if you hit a bump maybe really hard, or you hit, you know, you, you hit some rough surfaces, this mode might become something that participates in how the bike responds but this is a very exaggerated model. In fact, I wanna lower the amplitude of this model for a second, magnify it. Let's just go with one. Oops. One, okay, here's magnification one. So still looks a little exaggerated. <laughs> it's pretty funny. So anyway, this thing can do a lot of things with the model. So in conclusion, this model provided us with the ability to evaluate how the different tube sizes and wall thicknesses might affect the overall stiffness of the bike in comparison to other tube sets. The absolute values of the deflections and displacements and stresses are all still relatively uh, they're only as accurate as the model is, and so we wouldn't necessarily use these to decide if the frame is going to be strong enough to withstand the loads, but it gives us an opportunity to just understand the bike frame characteristics a little bit better. The vibration analysis is consistent with our perception in that we know that the predominant deflection of a bike happens to be in the transverse direction or the out of plane direction of the bike frame. We feel that when we're pedaling, we feel the frame flexing underneath us and we know that flexible frames will flex more, stiffer frames flex less. And we know, we now know that the flexible frame has a lower frequency of the natural period of vibration is lower for a flexible frame, which gets closer to our pedal stroke cadence. However, we do not reach what is called resonance ever because our frame is still stiffer and has a higher frequency for its natural period of vibration. The very first mode shape is roughly four hertz for this bike and our cadence is around one and a half hertz. And so those two won't reach resonance but there's a chance that uh, there is some effect of how the bike is responding to our pedal strokes because a flexible frame does have a lower mode of vibration. So um, I, hope it, I hope this video was fun and informative and we're not, uh, you know, it's not a design guide like I said before, but it's just a matter of looking at the how a 3D analysis tool could be used for bicycle frame analysis, I suppose. But uh, yeah, I'm sure there's other things that you could use this for. 
I'm sure there's a lot of people that will have some thoughts and comments, so feel free to leave those down below. And uh, I wanna thank everyone who stuck around this long. I hope this was worth your time. And we will, we will see you all in another video. I don't plan on making a lot of technical videos like this, so you can rest assured that this is just a temp once in a while kind of thing when a topic is of interest to me. But otherwise, I plan to do more of what I've already done. So again, thank you all for watching and have a nice evening.